me if I'm wrong. Did Princess Ozzy not offer anyone a title shot? She did name off a few. That's what I thought. Now, if this is for anyone, please tell me why Penelope Pink, who has had and lost all of her opportunities, she gets a title shot. Well, Penelope Pink Tormenta, was the who has had multiple title shots, she gets a title shot. Tormenta was a Mexican champ. The Beast who in my mind is the only one who deserves the title shot. Well, at least we agree on that. That's three. There's three. There's three right there. The fact of the matter is, that match should be me and the Beast and the Princess because my she just record gave me an idea. in singles That'd be competition a a since 2013 she just gave me the idea. is the longest undefeated reigning person in singles competition. Jessica Jones, oh, boy, she's, she's got a pretty good before that knee got so, injured. I'm calling it out. Nobody deserves it better than I do because I have more wins and less losses than all the other girls in this match combined. And I want you to make it happen. You know, when we all have our 15 minutes of fame, and I'd like to take a couple of my 15 minutes to talk about the rights and the wrongs in the world of professional wrestling. And it is for the WWE Championship. This match is for the ECW World Heavyweight Championship. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition. This is the Rights and Wrongs Supporters Podcast, and this is your host, Mr. Green. And we are coming into the 62nd week of WOW, Women of Wrestling, going non-stop. Well, I mean, you know what I'm saying. They're, they're not running 24 hours a day, but they this is a big thing for them. If you are like me and you've seen this company from its inception, you've seen that they have tried to be just like a normal TV show. We're going to do seasons, we're going to drop off, and they will come back. And that has never worked out for them. Not in the long haul. It has just not worked out. And I recall myself saying on a number of occasions, if I had control over WoW, that would be one of the first things I would change. Stop taking these breaks. It does not help you. The selling point of wrestling is that wrestling doesn't go off. It's, it's there year round. There's no season to it. Lo and behold, they turn around and then they're doing, you know, all, all year round. There's no seasons to wow anymore where they have it, but there's no break in between the seasons. We'll, we'll put it that way. But in any case, this is your WOW review for the week. If you did not tune into the previous episode and you like hearing about the ratings, then you want to go and tune in to uh, uh, the, the previous podcast that had the ratings listed for uh, all of October, I believe. That, can, that was, of course, provided by Russell Nomics. It would be... Uh, review 61 Night of Handcuffs. Now, I don't name these things. In fact, if considering the audience that it had, that's probably the last thing I would have named it Night of Handcuffs, but you know, whatever. I, I have no say so over that show. So, in any case, before I get started, I just want to say this bef before we get rolling is that surprisingly, despite what I am going to say pertaining to production, pertaining to continuity, and things of that nature with the show. I actually enjoyed this episode. I thought it was one of the most best paced episodes that they have presented of WoW, period. The downside of that is, you know, it <laughs> some of the stuff that they had in, in between these things were just nonsensical. But, you know, 
that they, they, there was a lot of improvement there. I mean, you know, the, the promos, the matches were good. Um, uh, them being on the microphone, which has started to open up a little bit more. Like I said, the promos, that some of them actually made sense. And I was so pleased. I was so pleased seeing all of this and, and hearing all of them do do these things on air. I, I have a list of pros and cons, and we'll we'll get off into into that. Uh, I do want to say some other things before we get rolling. One being is that in other news, Ronda Rousey made her, her debut in Ring of Honor. Imagine that. Now, this is not the first appearance that Ronda Rousey has had in a wrestling ring post-WWE. Uh, I believe that she had a match in uh, Mexico as well. The common denominator there is that she had these matches in places that were um, using one of her friends. Uh, who, uh, who was it? Uh, Shafir, I believe. Because we know that she has, you know, uh, strong ties to the four horsewomen. Maria Shafir, Baszler, and, um, ah, damn, who was the other one? Uh, and she, she escapes my my. My, my mind right now it, it, when it pops up and I'll let you know but yeah that, that, I can remember three of the four but in any case they, yeah, that, that would be the, the real um, tie, tying connection there is that somebody within her circle was also at the show and she wound up being their, their tag team partner I do believe it was Marina Shafir that was that was at that time uh, and then she showed up on on um, Ring of Honor television now and I use television loosely. That said, from what I understand, she is not signed to Ring of Honor. She is not signed to AEW. She is an absolute free agent, which, let's be honest, probably the best thing for her. She had a very special um, feel to her when she first got into WWE. Um, but she was not utilized as, say, a female, and I'm not saying that she should, but as a somewhat female version of Brock Lesnar, where it was a special occasion when you saw Brock. When Brock showed up, it was like, oh, my gosh, you know, that that type of thing. Um, She wasn't used that way in WWE. She was there pretty regularly at one point. Um, so... She lost a little bit of her luster, and I think that was easy to see when she was there. But now that she's not, and she can show up when she wants, how she wants, probably does not have to do the normal WWE stuff. Because, listen, I, I want to say for on her behalf, everybody does not belong or work well or function well in the WWE. Yes, it is true. They are the biggest wrestling promotion, even though they don't like calling themselves that. But they're the biggest wrestling promotion on the planet. That is absolutely true. And if she wanted to make the most money and get the most exposure within that industry, there was no other place for her to go. That said, it did not mean that it was the best place for her necessarily. She um, she probably needed somebody who was going to handle her as if Everything that she was doing in the wrestling ring was a shoot. Much like Lesnar. Lesnar doesn't participate in certain things. And if you go through his career, you'll see. Like he he very rarely, if at all, participated in comedy. And when I say comedy, I don't even mean like they wrote out a, a skip for him to you know do something like that. Any comedy that was derived from Brock Lesnar was derived from Brock Lesnar's personality being overbearing or something like that. Like you, you might have laughed at him when he came out with the uh, uh, <laughs> his Money in the Bank briefcase spray painted like <laughs> like a boombox, and he's dancing on it. But it did not go beyond credibility. It didn't go beyond what you would think a Brock Lesnar would do. You see what I'm saying? He, him being in comedy was only relative to something that worked for Brock Lesnar. 
Not like what they did with Bill Goldberg when he's in the backstage segment and Gold Dust decides to put his wig on his head. You know, something ridiculous like that. Ronda Rousey kind of fell into some of that. Where like, hey, we need you to make sure you smile. You're a baby face. Smile on the way to the ring. And when you win, point to the sign. And, you know, things like that. That that did not really fit her character. They they stressed over and over and over again that she's the baddest woman on the planet. You know, they they beat you in the head with that, but it didn't really, it didn't really take. You know, it it just it did initially, and then it kind of wore off because her attitude outside the ring, her griping with wrestling fans, the way she was presented on TV, it's just a series of things. But all of that to say that it may be better for her. It, it's. I hope Tony Khan isn't handling this, but it may be better for her as a on the pro wrestling side of her career to be a free agent and get to understand what wrestling fans like about her and what they dislike about her, not just WWE fans. She now has the opportunity if she chooses to continue on and I think that there's a little bit of the wrestling bug that's in her if she is going to do that her going where she wants to and how she wants to staying as long as she feels like it may be the best thing for her and who knows maybe she will sign with AEW maybe she will sign you know to do her ring of honor tapings and things like that and I'm I am sure a lot of that is on the behest of her friend Marina Shafir, Jessamine Duke. That's what I couldn't think of. Jessamine Duke. That just hit me like a bolt of lightning right there. But yeah, Jessamine Duke, Marina Shafir, Shayna Baszler, Ronda Rouse. I'm sure a lot of that is built on their relationship. And I'm interested in seeing what she will do beyond a WWE universe. In an environment where she can, and, and you would think and, and I say you would think because Ring of Honor isn't necessarily the same Ring of Honor that it was even two or three years ago. But you would think that in an environment like that, that kind of uh, built itself on and itself around the competition in the ring, that she would be able to, to thrive there. It's one of those places that your in-ring work is is what carries you of course they like the uh, the promos. Of course they want to he- see a personality and so on and so forth. But there's a lot of people who, you know, would get by in a ring of honor in that environment that would not be able to in WWE because they didn't have the personality for it, but they were damn good in the in the ring. Um they have several people that have gone through Ring of Honor who fit that criteria. Roderick Strong is probably one of the most notable. Doesn't have a strong personality. He, you know, they're they're working on it now, but he does. He doesn't have a strong personality. Never had it before, but he's a very good wrestler. And in Ring of Honor, he was able to thrive because that in the early days of TNA, he was able to thrive actually, just because they didn't try to change him. He remained Roderick Strong, master of the backbreaker. And they built around that. So anyway, yeah, I just I wanted to make sure that, that I brought that up, that Ronda Rousey has made her debut, but it is not a contracted thing that she's there long term. She just showed up. And she was, you know, of course they weren't going to be like, I oh, know we can't use Ronda Rousey. Yeah, they, they, they utilized her and probably using that as a bit of a lure to get people to look at uh, or sign into their honor club just to be able to see the match, see what she did, see what she said. So that's uh, that's one thing we, we had to make sure that was addressed. Uh, also, and this might be a bit of a spoiler considering how Wild does their tapings, but uh, Jennifer Gen Z Flores has uh, departed from Wow. Of course, she wrestles under the name of Jasmine Allure. And as of me um, doing this, 
podcast. I want to say that she posted it on Saturday. That would be the uh, uh, the 18th, I believe, <clears throat> or somewhere thereabout. And she put this on her Instagram pertaining to this subject, of course. Thank you, wow. Thank you, the AJ Mendez, for giving me this opportunity. It's been an experience that I'll never forget. I've met people who are now family to me and learned so much. But let's spread these wings and fly. That was her statement of departure as it relates to wow. And honestly, probably good on her to leave. And I'm not, you know, that's not to say, of course, that she cannot return a while somewhere down the line. But let's be honest when we look at her career and the overall use of people who have been in the wild. Wow. And I, I said it before, but I hate saying it, but I have to. Wow does not have a track record of making stars. They just don't. As far as I know, not only she, but. Uh, Amber Rodriguez and Wrecking Ball have all departed from WOW. Now, Rodriguez may have just given up on wrestling entirely. From what I understand, the last thing that I saw in one of the, uh, one of the groups that discussed WOW is that he's, he believes that she has uh, retired from wrestling altogether, which would be a little bit sad that wow is the last place that we got to see her and that was how she was presented is is very 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 forgettable which when you look at jennifer gen z flores also very 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 forgettable it was i guess let's take this time to do a recap of her career to some degree and it'll be it's not gonna be long uh, and I mean the career of Gen Z Flores, not Jasmine Allure. She was introduced as, as what, a millennial. I love being on social media. I love posting videos and this, that, and the other. That was, that was the introduction that we got to her, more or less. None of that played into anything that she did on camera whatsoever. Didn't play into it at all. Did not use it. Didn't. None of this that she talked about was ever brought up ever again. It just, it just moved on. And then she just became the girl that went out there and provided a good match for other people and then got beat. If her objective in the wrestling industry was to grow, climb the ladder, try to gain more opportunities and things like that. I mean, this probably was a good opportunity for her just to be in a televised environment on national TV. But on the other side of that coin, how much can you give to the company and not get anything back? Because believe it or not, your presentation on TV does affect you in the future. Why would they bring someone else, you know, bring somebody in? Let's just say AEW, for instance. Why would they bring somebody in like Jasmine Allure, who's been beaten constantly on their television, and then bring her in as if she adds value to them? She wouldn't have any value. First off, that's assuming that the AEW audience saw her at all. Does being on the WOW give you the credibility to just jump into an AEW? Does it give you the credibility to jump into an impact wrestling for that matter? I mean, I know that that because that's always the, the, the ratings comparable that people like to throw in. Like, well, they got more higher ratings than impact. Well, that may be. And we've explained why. But does anybody on the WOW roster, if they showed up at impact tomorrow would it be a big deal for their knockouts division would it help would it drive more people to watch it should they come in and just start winning immediately i don't think jasmine Lou has that and again you know she does did she get paid more at wow is a debatable thing you know because even though they they seemingly have good pay rate and i'm i can't 
knock them for that, nor can I knock the individuals that want to go because <clears throat> because they're getting you know a reasonable paycheck and they're on TV. That's every reason that most people want to be in wrestling to begin with. But when you go beyond this, if she was slotted as being Jennifer Gen Z Flores, just person to eat up a three count week in and week out, did that help her? My answer would be no. My answer to that would be no. It, it, it didn't help her at all. It wasn't going to lend itself into going anyplace else. She almost would have a better chance by going on the independent, and I'm just talking about in, in terms of her presentation. And she would almost have a better opportunity in giving promoters better matches that she did on the indies that showcased who she is, how she wants to be presented, you know, not just bringing somebody else's vision to life. And I get a, a I get a strong feeling that that happens in WoW, that he may talk to them about something, they may say something, then he'll just kind of gravitate towards that thing and then, hey, well, we have a gimmick that'll work for you. You'll be the Gen, Gen Z person, which much like everybody else on WoW, the, you know, is a paper-thin character and that had no depth to it. She didn't even come out the ring with a phone, which was the whole build on the video package they gave her. I thought they had a lost opportunity with, with Jennifer Flores. I Alex Shelley and TNA did paparazzi productions. Like, why they didn't rip that off? And I, I'll just go ahead and say it should have been ripped off. But why they didn't do that, I have no idea. It was it was almost custom made for that. For those of you that were not aware what paparazzi productions were, he Alex Shelley, who their current champion, Impact champion, soon to be TNA champion, he would come down to ringside with a with a camera, you know, it was a prosumer camera and a tripod. And he would set it up and he would record the match that he was in. Sometimes he would record the match of the people that he was going to be facing. Why wouldn't a Jennifer Gen Z Flores do something similar to that? She's got a tripod. She's got a bracket for a phone. And you could have gone one step further and had her stream her match directly to the WoW YouTube channel or Instagram or wherever they wanted to go. Like she, or, or to make it make more sense, stream it to her WoW Instagram, not just WoW in general. Come up, put your... Put your phone down there, click it, you know, turn it on, start streaming. The fact that it looks amateur or, and it's just streaming is one thing would be perfectly fine. People, it would give people something to believe in, that's for certain. But, you know, that, that, that was just a wasted gimmick and angle. Didn't go anywhere, didn't do anything. And she did her job well. Before we end on that, we have to say Jasmine Allure did her job well. She was there to help put other people over. She was there to help um, make them look good. They didn't do her any favors by introducing her like she was a, going to be a top name and this video package and all that stuff. She barely did anything. She she barely spoke. She barely got any any angles. Really didn't do much beyond that. It was just, okay, this is it and you're done. So... On the one hand, I'm surprised because, again, most people that come into WOW tend to become fiercely loyal to it and, and don't want to leave, but they also haven't been there this long. WOW has not existed in you know for 62 weeks at any given point, and some of them may be feeling a little frustrated now. You know, may, Maybe the bloom's off the rose for them having worked in it. Like, you know, it's time for me to go. <clears throat> who knows the reason behind Wrecking Ball and who knows – the reasons behind Amber Rodriguez, if she has uh, come to terms with wrestling in general, that's very sad. Again, you know, her having her last matches potentially on wild television, I don't know if that's a good way for her to go out. I don't know if that's a good closing chapter for her. I hope that's not the case. I hope that she is out there somewhere and 
willing to give Amber Rodriguez the chance that the persona Amber Rodriguez deserves. But if not, then, you know, what can we say? So, now that we've gotten those out of the way, let's go into the episode. If I didn't say it before, the air date for this one was November 18th, episode 62, chronologically, episode 210, for those of you that are doing it in TV seasons, the title, Unsanctioned. The title, of course, is a reference to what their main event is, and we will um, talk about what was the point behind that, you know, at, at, when we get there. So the show opens. Beast opens up with a show, I mean, with a promo at the start of the show on Vicky Lynn. I, I understand that the Beast is a character. I don't necessarily have to agree with the character. But I understand that she is a character and she has to do her shtick. I'm still the biggest, I'm still the baddest, and you know, all that good stuff. Which I I don't um I don't think that that works out necessarily as a good catchphrase if that is what she's aiming for or if that is what someone is aiming for for her. But, you know, it is what it is, and we will move on. One of the things that the Beast didn't drag this down, but the commentators did. Stephen Dick and Dave McClain do the simultaneous The Beast is Unleashed at the commentator booth. And that was terrible. This is this is just one of those things like, you know, I keep saying Stephen Dick is being dragged down by Dave McClain, and this is probably one of the better examples of it. Having him do this. Uh, every week that goes by, I start to lose a little bit more faith in him. <laughs> I want him to be a good play-by-play guy. But every week that he has to do and participate in nonsense like that, I, I just I lose more faith in him. And, and just the commentating powers of, of WoW in general. Sometimes Steve, I mean, David McClain can say something that makes all the sense in the world. Sometimes he he's, he does well. Other times it's, it's cartoon McClain. And that's what this is. It's like I, I have this buzzword that I've loved using in WoW for over 20 years now. So let's just do it again. It was WoW is Unleashed. WoW Unleashed pay-per-view. Cage Heat is Unleashed. The beast is unleashed. He just loves the unleashed buzzword. And to have them both say this simultaneously, as if it was perfectly rehearsed, is just ridiculous. I cannot think of another time in watching wrestling over all the years that I've watched wrestling that I felt like somebody had an absolute rehearsal to get this one line. Uh, that that drug that little opening segment down, but we'll we'll move on from that. So the second segment is a match, and it is a championship match. This is the second week in a row that they've opened the show with a championship match. The first time they did it was the previous week with Class Master and G.I. Jane taking on the Tonka Twins for the Tag Team Championships. Now, they are opening up with Princess Ozzy taking on Gloria Glitter for the Wild Championship. I did not have a problem with the match. As I said at the start of this, like the matches, no problem with pretty much any of them. And I expected them to be good. I expected Princess Ozzy and Gloria Glitter, Sherry Simone or and uh, Dalala Doom, I expected them to be good because they have a life of wrestling experience that precedes WOW. Now, I don't know whether Ozzy takes any other bookings outside of WOW these days because, like I said before, 
Some of them, once they're in the WoW system, tend not to want to go anywhere else. They're like, oh, I'm only working for WoW now. But the, but I don't know if, if she is still out on the circuit. I haven't haven't checked it, but I also haven't seen her name pop up for many of the things that I'm in tune to. Um, Aussie looks good as a champion. I, I don't want to take anything away from that. Glitter looks good as a as a challenger, even though it was very soon for her to get a championship match. And that was one of the first things that was brought up when I was watching this in the, in the hub at work, because I've gotten people there to start watching this thing. They they have seen me look at this for like a year straight, and now it's turned from. Uh, oh, I can't believe you're watching that stuff. To now they're watching, asking questions like, "So, wait, 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 what happened here? Why is this? What's that?" So, <laughs> some have been converted into casual viewers. So the question that I got here is like, "Why did Gloria Glitter get this match? She just got there. That was the words out of his mouth." And I said, "That's true. That's fine. You know, and I'm glad you noticed that." And that's not necessarily a bad thing because, you know, these things do happen from time to time. Not just in WoW, just in, in wrestling in general. And usually it's just explained off as, you know, is something akin to championship prerogative. That's what I called it when I, you know, did commentary. It's a championship prerogative. Because the champions always had the ability to accept a challenge if they wanted to or not. So it it wasn't really a lot to explain to me, it, you know, in in my view. I mean, we had the Tonga Twins do it a week prior, giving a title match to a team that had never teamed up before. Classmaster and G.I. Jane, they, ne- they never was a team, but they got a title match. So, you know, if you could allow it for them, you could allow it for this. And, you know, there was, there was no big, big to do. The problem here was that David McLean over-explained it. David McLean and Stephen Dickey over-explained the situation. I mean, it was like a literal two and a half minutes of them going into her backstory and people not taking her literally or seriously and with the sticks, and then she realized that the power was in her. I mean, just, just a whole explanation and she wanted to make sure that people got a chance to do this and that and the other. It was over-explained. He should have been able to say that in 30 seconds or less. Princess Ozzy has an open contract. She wants to take on everybody. Prove that she's the champion, that she's the fighting champion. Done. You're done. That's it. That's all the explanation they needed. And if you go into the conversation about it later, that's fine. But do you but that one spot, what I just said right there, you can word it any other way you feel like it. That is all that was necessary. You didn't have to hear about the sticks or her grandmother or her being part of the dark side or her losing faith. and then, you know, All of that was absolutely unnecessary. It's just word salad. And that's not something I say often, but that was it was just utter word salad. Let's just toss out a bunch of stuff that we're talking about go around the bend to get to the point when they could have took a straight line. They could have taken a straight line and then just been done with that. And in the course of doing all of that, that mean that the match in the ring is being completely ignored because they're trying to explain why Glitter is in there in the first place. Now, what should have happened in a perfect wrestling environment is that Princess Ozzy should have explained that herself preceding this show not just this match but this show when i'm in the ring you know i I never had opportunity myself and i want to be the fighting champion that wow deserves so i am officially putting on an open contract if you want to match all you gotta do is go by my dressing room sign the contract and then we'll make it happen or something along those lines it's not you know it's not incredibly difficult for that for the explanation i mean but much like everything else that WoW does, a lot of the key points of things that we didn't see and or hear have to be explained by Stephen Dickey and David McLean, which is not good. It's, it's just horrible that they have to be the, the source of things that we should have saw. 
So anyway, uh, one of the things I would say that I felt like happened here, and I can't prove it, that this match showed me that the crowd is clearly coached. We have to respond when this person tells us to respond. We have to applaud when Ozzy's in charge and you know all that good stuff. Make sure you hit your thunderclappers together when she looks like she's going to win. But like I said, you know, I, I can't prove that. <laughs> so I'm just I'm just going with what it seems like to me on a production standpoint. Uh <clears throat> match is good. No real complaints there. Both of these ladies seem to have worked hard to try to get the point across the challenge and the champion and, the, you know, the, the situation that she's in. It wasn't anything over, overly complicated. It was just simply the champion is in here with somebody who wants the belt, right? And I'm going to do what I have to do to try to get it. And she did that within the context of who Gloria Glitter is. She does the whole step aerobics on top of her back and all that stuff, which I guess is going to be her her new in-match gimmick. Uh, let's just get to the end of the match so I can make the, the calls that I, I felt like were pertinent to this. So at the end, Gloria Glitter is trying to apply what looks like a gory bomb. Ozzy is able to get out of that. And from getting out of that, she hits her cutter. Now, I'm not going to do what Stephen Dickey did. And this is an open statement to Stephen Dickey and David McClain. Stop using cutter from down under. God, that is such a stupid name. And then he's, when he says he has to say it like two or three times just to get the point across. Cut her from down under. I was like, oh, God, just call it a cutter. It doesn't have to be from down under. Okay. You know, and, it, and it's not going to rhyme no matter how you, how you try to force it to. Just, just call it a cutter. It's not going to take anything away from Princess Ozzy just to call it a cutter. Cutter from down under is a, just a dumb name. Doesn't roll off of the tongue. No one's ever going to refer to it that way outside of wow. So just cut her. She hits her with a cutter. End of story. So she hits that, which is her setup move for the frog splash off the top rope. Of course, glitters down. She stays down. Referees, for some reason, like, hey, you got to get off the top rope, which I never understood that off the rust when they used the top rope constantly. Here's the frog splash. One, two, three, we're done. Good match. Commentators heard it a bit, but it's, it's a good match. And this is the point where I say this crowd is clearly coached because I, I as the audience is applauding, Seeing Princess Ozzy win. If you look in the back and you watch some of these people, and I, I only see this, in fairness to WoW, I only see this because I have to watch it several times in order for me to uh, do a proper review. But you can clearly see people are just absolutely hamming this thing up. I mean, they, they are hamming it up out there. You got one guy, he, he like a super duper smile on his face and, and he's talking to the people next to him like, yeah, I know I was supposed to clap. you know. But I mean, they, they, they just like ham this thing up like, yeah, yeah, you know, like it, like they were at WrestleMania or something. <clears throat> I'm not saying everybody in there is doing it, but I certainly believe there's a few. So the match again, thumbs up. Then we get to the portion where it takes a nosedive. And it wasn't even like the entire promo that happens after this thing was bad. That's the, that's the sad part about this. So Ozzy wins, and she cuts a promo after the match. And she is, you know, talking about being a champion and uh, some of the people who are feeling like they won a title shot. Talking about this is the first time I had a championship match that didn't revolve around, you know, Tormenta or or uh, Penelope Pink and Lana Starr and so on and so forth, which all of that I was I was on board with. Sounded good. And then she starts talking about people who want to be challengers. 
you know, the beast wants to be a challenger and, you know, pink and this person and that person. And here's where it took the, you know, a, a massive detour into fail. She then says, I have a, a proposal. A championship challenge match. Now, Dave, she's looking at David McLean saying this. He's like, a championship challenge match? What's that? And then immediately she goes around like, I haven't worked out all the details. I don't <laughs> So, like, I haven't worked out all the details, and I don't know the rules. That's for you to figure out. I'm like, what, 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 what was this? What was this? How do you make a proposal to somebody? It's like, I have a proposal. And the only thing that you give them is the name. And like, now, I don't know what else is going to happen there. You figure that out. <laughs> it's like. And, and then he sits back, had the nerve to sit there in that booth like it was a great idea. Like, oh, yeah, that gives me an idea. I was like, well, oh, man, this was, this was just, I, I overused dumb here, but this is dumb. This was dumb. It would be like you saying, I am going to write a book, and I'm going to call it, you know, I don't know, Last call for so and so. Now I don't know what the book is going to be about. I don't know who's in it or what the plot is, but you can figure that out. Then you don't have a book. Same rule applies here. I have a proposal, but you don't know what it is or how it's going to function. Then you don't have a proposal. Who in their right mind accepts that? I wish. Somebody would walk into somebody's office with a proposal that only had like the title and see what kind of reaction you get. She had a good promo that took a nosedive because of that one thing. I don't know. Seriously, why even open your mouth and bring it up? Uh, fortunately, that doesn't take away from the match. But it does take away from the show. I was like, this, this, this promo, I don't know if she sat back there and came up with it on her own and they gave her the bullet points. or It sounds like bullet points. Or I don't know if they wrote it out for him like, yeah, hey, just we're going to hand it off to Dave McClain. He'll figure it out. I was like, I, and it, that is it's so absurd. That is so absurd. So anyway. She has a proposal that isn't a proposal at all. That's ultimately what that promo was. And I can only guess, without having seen anything, that it's going to lead to some multi-person championship match of some sort, which they were probably under-deliver on, like they under-deliver on everything. The next segment is Adriana Gambino versus Tiki Chamorro. Now, I wrote the first thing I had here was, considering Gambino's promo previously, this should be a win for her. And I was, I was happy with that. Because that's ultimately what it came down to. And it should. This was booking the way it's supposed to be. It should have come down to a win for Gambino, and it did. Which was, again, which is great. Now... It didn't, uh, nothing against Tiki Chamorro. Tiki in this instance is just there to help pad Gambino's run. And I, and you know, I'm fine with that. This is another case of wow, kind of, or the commentator saying or doing something that was ridiculous that um, it didn't distract from the match. It probably just shouldn't have been said because it's pointless. Somewhere in the course of this match, they're saying, you know, while I was coming, you know, thinking about this is verbatim, so don't, you know, don't take this as word for word, but basically saying that while I was thinking about going to different cities and bringing, bringing Wild to your town. All right, first off, we know that that's not happening, at least not right now. Secondly, 
Dave McClain sitting on commentator say, yeah, so call your local TV stations to get wild in your town. <sighs> Dave has been in TV for a long time, and I know he knows better. I know he knows better. He's been in TV far longer than I have. Maybe not on the, in the same position, but, I mean, he certainly knows better. Calling your local TV station to get a live event there does not work. TV stations have no power over that. Do they have people that's in the office that have relationships with people that are in arenas? Yes. But that is not how bringing somebody to your town works. And he knows that. It is an utter waste of time and breath for any kid out there to call their local TV station to say, hey, I want Wild to come to my town. First off, for that to make any sort of traction with anybody, it would have to be like a flood of calls. So much to the point that they cannot ignore it. Like you, you would have to have thousands of people make that phone call to where they're like, oh my gosh, we need to do something about it. That would be the only way that you could even get close to that. Secondly, like I said, TV stations don't have that kind of authority. They can't just make somebody show up at the thing just because you called a TV station. I will repeat, they probably have some relationship or some connection. Somebody in the office knows somebody that works at an arena or something thereof. But aside from that, what are they supposed to do? Their job is to air it, <laughs> not book the show. You want wow in your, your neck of the woods or your town or whatever the case may be, then you write wow and tell them that. Tell them, I want you in my town and here's a location that you can do it. It fits this and that, blah, blah, here's the number. If that's what you want, that's what you do. You can set up here. This location could accommodate your show they had, you know, there's local TV crews here or this production company is willing to work with you. What if this place seats 500, you know, whatever the case would be. That, if that's what you want, then that's what you do. You contact WOW. You send them the email. You have them reach out to those stations. I mean, not the stations. But you have them reach out to those arenas. No TV station is going to go through the logistics of trying to book a wrestling show. So I don't even know why he said it. Other than just to say some some nonsense that might have applied 30, 40 years ago. There's very few local TV stations that had that kind of power and pull these days. Anyway. <clears throat> and I don't even know why that bothered me so much. But I mean, probably because I know that he's in TV and he knows better. That I think that that just... For whatever reason, that line during the course of this match just stuck with me. And it just annoyed me for some reason. I was like, man, come on. You know better than this. You know better than this. So anyhow, <laughs> everybody that's listening to this show understands and knows my feelings about Adriana Gambino. I think she looks like a star. I think she works well. Uh, Tiki Tomorrow has, has grown on me. I know that she's not going to be any sort of wild champion, or at least it would be a shock if she did. But um, she's, she's a game player. I, I'll give her that. Tiny, you know, probably not as, as refined a wrestler as she could be, but she is a game player, and I, and I enjoy what she has given for the little bit that she's given. Uh, I will also point out that the editors did a fine job for Gambino doing her deal in the corner, which she probably should have known was not going to work because she's too tall for Tiki Chamorro. One of the things that Gambino likes to do as a signature is she puts her opponent in the corner, she turns her back to him, and she does a incredibly high kick. While facing away from her opponent, her back is to uh, her opponent's chest, and she'll just kick her leg up and the shin knee or foot depending depending on the person's height will connect with the person behind them. 
This clearly did not do that because Tiki's too small for this. And I'm, I would imagine that if she was going to do this again, she being Gambino, she probably wouldn't try it because it just didn't, didn't really ring the right way. They had to cut away from it. Because, other, because even if he connected with her knee, let's say, her foot was probably eight foot over top of Tiki's head. So it didn't look good on television. Or it wouldn't have looked good on television. But uh, <clears throat> Gambino's still doing her thing. Tomorrow in this match is playing the underdog. And she does a good job playing the underdog. I guess she is their new generation Steffi Slays. <laughs> Except she probably has a better presentation of Steffi Slays and larger, uh, more important wins. Uh, Gambino does a great split leg drop, which is, in my view, her equivalent of what Sami Zayn does with the blue, blue thunder bomb. By that I mean it's the move that Sami Zayn does all the time for a pin, and he holds it like it's like ah this time I'm gonna get it, but he never gets it. I think he might pin somebody with it once. It's that that one move that like you know it's not the finish, but they treat it like that. Gamino does the same thing here. She she is illustrating her flexibility. She does this crazy high split, like once tomorrow's on the ground on the mat, but gets her leg up and this this high kick comes down with the split right across the midsection, hooks the leg, and then she does the old you know her Italian motioning. I don't even know what, it, what you would call that. Somebody have to write in and tell me. But, uh, yeah, she does that, and then she's she's uh, hoisted off by Chamorro in her last-minute kick out. So, towards the end of the match, Chamorro is able to get Gambino up on her shoulders briefly, but Gambino is able to break free, shoots Chamorro off. Chamorro ducks underneath the clothesline. Hits her with a headbutt, which sets her up because she turns directly to the second rope and sets herself down into her variation of a 619. I don't know what, and I forget what they call it for here. And then she tries to go for a splash, and it is a terrible looking <laughs> execution of a splash. But I know it probably felt that way because she knew that she was going to come down on the knees. That was That's what the spot called for. But, it, but, yeah, she she didn't really get up there and deliver. <clears throat> but, you know, what, what can you say? So Gambino brought up the knees, stopped the splash. Then she gets up, hits a cradle neck breaker. One, two, three. Tomorrow's done. And Gambino gets her 4-0 win. And what does she do? She gets on the microphone and she cuts a promo. It's amazing how that works. Like, I went for weeks complaining about, you know, they need promos. They need promos. They need promos. And now, all of a sudden, it's promos. Amazing. So she cuts another promo. She said, hey, that's 4-0 for Gambino. When am I going to get my title shot? And, and, And I will reiterate, I don't like everybody going after the championship, but, or, or, um, making measure on the championship, but I don't mind it with Gambino because she's a heel. That's the first thing. And she's supposed to be overbearing and, you know, narcissistic and all that good stuff. And like I said at the beginning, clearly this is all leading towards some form of multi-person match. And I would imagine that everybody that has even remotely said anything about I want a championship match or as a matter of time or this, that, and the other is probably going to be in it somehow. So the promo was fine. I didn't. I didn't uh, have any any problems with this. It gets the point across, drives whatever angle that they're doing collectively forward. So I thought that was good. Um, once we get out of that, the next segment is Lana Starr and Vicky Lynn having a conversation in the hallway. This goes back to, I don't have a problem with the matches, but I certainly have a problem with all the stuff around the matches. And this is one of those stuffs (laughs) that's around the match. This is 
a I can't call it a promo. We'll call it a scene. They have a scene that is taking place between Lana Starr and Vicky Lynn McCoy in the hallway. And what we see here, first, the set design that they do on these shows are atrocious. Hire somebody else. I'm I'm almost certain that a lot of this is built on and built around uh, the sensibilities of a David McLean. Like you have to have you know your your poster up. You got to got to be near your poster. It, it it was passable before, but now it's just it's absurd. It's it's, it's stretched off into the land of absurdity. The amount of times they just happen to have a conversation directly in front of a poster that so happens to be theirs or associated with them. is Why is there a feather boa hanging in the background of the hallway? Why is it that this hallway just happens to have fabulous forest paraphernalia? I can see it if it's in their locker room, but... What does it need to be in the hall for? Things like that. Get somebody else to do do your set design. This, this, This entire building cannot possibly be papered up with just wow posters for the people who work in wow. I mean, I understand when you're talking about it in the, the lobby area or where the people come in or the merchandise stand, or even in the arena, I get it. But for what reason does it serve to have this in the backstage area with people who work there? I yeah, you you do it when you have stuff that you're trying to, you know, illustrate that, hey, we have this, we have that, and it's decoration. I mean, I have that at my job. They got posters of CBS shows. But those posters get rotated in and out, and they don't just happen to be there when Gary Cole of NCIS is there and is is, we just put it right next to him so people can see it and know that he's on this show. You know what I mean? They they don't have uh, the the stars of SWAT standing by a SWAT poster on on the TV show SWAT. And I know some of them are like, what well, the WWE does? It. Yeah, but you know what? The WWE was always promoting a pay-per-view or a premium live event now. So you weren't necessarily getting a poster of L.A. Knight necessarily if he just walked backstage and like, oh, he's standing next to an L.A. Knight poster. You didn't necessarily get that. But what you might have got is L.A. Knight going into a room with a poster of him on it against Roman Reigns for Crown Jewel. They weren't promoting LA Knight specifically. They're promoting the event. Here is just ego. I'm sure that a lot of this is, you know, hey, we're going to put these people on and it will make them stars and it'll help illustrate the, the backstage and all that stuff. But, it, yeah, get somebody else that knows what they're doing for set design instead of just throwing posters up every two feet for the people that happen to be in the scene. All right, so moving on. Uh, yeah, this, uh, uh, yeah. the purpose of the conversation was um, trying to sell this unsanctioned match as unprecedented and WOW, despite the fact that WOW has had like three no holds barred matches less than a month ago. But that's what this is for. It was just there to try to sell the danger of the match. Like, ah, well, Lana's basically trying to talk her herself out of having to be at ringside which again I don't understand why she would have to do it she's no showed several matches to say nothing of the fact that Dave McClain banned her off of at least one so this is where that inconsistency comes in why is it that this match is any more special or any different than the Fall Sky Anywhere match why is it any more special or any different than the no holds bar tag team match that they had. Why is this any special, any different than any other no holds barred match that they have had in the last year? 
besides that they're just saying that it's unsanctioned. And for what reason is this unsanctioned? What have Vicki Lynn McCoy and the Beast do to warrant an unsanctioned match? I said this about the last stipulation match that they had with the handcuffs, and I'll repeat it now. It's like somebody saw the stipulation and decided that it works without building or setting it up. It would have been easier to digest if for weeks these two had broken the rules or beaten people up and you know around them or you know they were uncontrollable by security they were whacking each other with chairs you know just just whatever it took to relate the uncontrollable nature of them on camera Rather than we have these two people who are big and they're going to fight and we well we just and they got no rules so it must be dangerous. It's just it's just poorly done. But that's what this segment is. is it's just there to try to sell the idea the main event is supposed to be dangerous and to get Lana Star out of it. So they're fine here. The purpose of it is ridiculous, but their performance of it is fine. If that makes sense. Vic is a good promo. The logic is bad, but she sells it as well as she could possibly sell it. The one thing that she's doing, like, you're scared to come out there, aren't you? And Lana seems like she's backtracking a bit. And then she's like, well, you should be. And then she gives the reasons why she should be scared to be out there with the two of them because they're going to destroy each other. And, you know, the same, same old song and dance. Next segment. Ice Cold with Exile taking on Jesse Jones with Americana. Why do they keep carrying on talking about this dissension between Exile and Ice Cold when we haven't seen it? This is another case of I really had no problems with this match whatsoever. The match, even with Ice Cold, who I doubt has any sort of extensive wrestling ability, the match was fine. I enjoyed the match. I certainly think Jesse Jones is a star maker and you know in that regard that she can pretty much get a good match out of almost anybody that they put in the ring with. Uh but this dissension that they constantly talk about. Up until you got to the end, where where was any of this? Where was any of this, we're having problems and, you know, what what have you, the, where was any of that? We hadn't seen it, and, and it was reliant on Stephen Dickey and David McClain to try to sell people like, oh, man, they're, having, they're still having problems, David. What problems? What is it even over? Why are they arguing? Like, none of, those, none of these things have ever been illustrated or answered what reason are they even arguing what are they arguing for what event caused them to have this like break in communication it just i mean for them it is it just is and this is just very poor storytelling there's no other way to put that it is poor storytelling poor So, and uh, by the way, they need to do something with Dickie's audio. They probably need to bring him up a little bit. He he has his moments where he does fine, but uh, he does speak a little low. So they probably need to bring him up for the broadcast just a little bit. That's a production thing. So anyway, he and he needs to figure out his style. Uh, Dicky does. He shouldn't have to tell the story and do the play-by-play. All right, so now let me get back to what I was doing. I know I wasn't, I didn't go into the match yet. Uh, The important thing here in this match is the uh, transition or the, the story that's being told. Of the matches that have been on so far, this is the one that had some sort of existing angle, I guess, if you want to call it that. 
that was lined underneath. You could you could say the same thing with Gambino and and uh, tomorrow's match, but tomorrow wasn't part of the angle. The angle was Gambino and her win streak. Anybody could have fit in that spot. Here, this has been some ongoing thing with Ice Ice Cold and Exile and Jesse Jones and American. This has been an ongoing thing, even though it's been poorly done. It's been an ongoing thing. I have liked Exile. And even with the combination of Ice Cold, I, I've liked them as a presentation. So this whole thing just disappoints me to no end. I mean, I saw such potential with them as a team. And you talk about dropped angles. What happened to them? Like, Dave McLean, we deserve a title shot. What happened to that? Hasn't gone anywhere. Hadn't been brought up since. And, by the way, I think I, I, I need to uh, shout out Lindsey Ray Gunn, who informed me that um, Exodus does wrestle outside of WOW. She, she put that on, on one of the, the comments. Exodus does wrestle outside of WOW. It's KZT. And I, I thank you for that because she's another one of those people that, that – Kind of inherently, you feel like, man, she is really good, and I, I like to see more of her. And, and it's funny how that works that way. Like, I had no idea that she was on the indies, but she works well, so it fits. And it just so happens that this woman has a wrestling background beyond wow. Like, every time I've ever said that I like somebody here, it seemingly works out that they wrestled someplace other than wow. Go figure. So anyway, the, again, the match in and of itself is not necessarily important. It was a good match. But the important part is the spots that took place during the match. And so now we're, we're going to go off into the poor storytelling that they have gone on between Jesse Jones and Americana and Exile and Ice Cold. Because all of this is just sad and just badly done. So we know that they're, they've they set up this whole issue with Americana and Jesse Jones. And they've set up an issue between Ice Cold and Exile, which is, again, pointless. They, they never brought up why. They just have it. Ice, I mean, not Ice Cold, but Americana and Jesse Jones has been a little bit more illustrated. At least that stuff has happened on, on screen to some degree even though it started up right in the middle of them having problems, apparently. But uh, there's there's something there that we can look at and point to. Like, okay, well, they did this or they did that. The problem here is they are trying to position Americana in a sympathetic role. That being, you do the right thing, you... you, you uh, play by the rules and, you know, what have you. On paper, that would make sense. That if your partner is cheating and you're a baby face, then there should be some sympathy towards the one who is being good here. Now, I again say it on paper, that makes sense. The problem here is the execution. The execution was horrible. Why? So let's start with this. You got Exile, both members, sitting in Ice Cold's corner. You have Americana and Jesse Jones's corner, right? So let's start off with that as the thing. Jones and Ice Cold are having what is looking like a pretty standard exchange of holes. They go from wrist lock to wrist lock, you know, top wrist lock changing, you know, move and counter move. It is making Ice Cold look comparable and good. Jesse Jones is keeping her on her level, more or less. I mean, not totally, but of course she's going to keep her where the competition is still working. You understand? Ice Cold is not being outdone. Ice Cold is not being... Uh, uh, just outshone 
None of those things are happening. She is right along with Jesse Jones until Jesse Jones gets in the corner of the opposition and both Exodus and Genesis grab the ankle of Jesse Jones, preventing her from going and, you know, charging ice cold. So when she turns her back to, to ice cold to phase exile, ice cold comes up and tags her behind. Now, meanwhile, Americana is sitting on the thumbs and hadn't done anything. So we keep that in mind. She's just watching this. That is the first cheating motion that has happened in this match. Exile drew first blood, more or less. But it opens it up for Ice Cold. And Ice Cold gets a nice neck breaker and Jesse Jones kicks out, of course. <clears throat> and they are doing what you would expect a heel team to do. They're cheating on behalf of their friend. Ice Cold uh, did, a, did a nice little move in the corner, takes her in there, comes up with a high knee, sweeps the leg out from underneath her, drops Jesse Jones in the corner, does the choke out with her foot. I mean, they're, they're, they're working a good match, and Jesse's selling this thing. She is really selling that. She is being choked out. And then you have Exodus and Genesis. One's grabbing the hair. The other one's choking her out. And that holds her in place, her being Jesse Jones, long enough for Ice Cold to then come again because while she was being choked, she was bridged to some degree, Jesse Jones. Ice Cold comes in, drops both knees across the, ch- the abdomen. I was going to say the chest, but the abdomen. And then she gets a low drop kick in the corner. Beautiful stuff. Americana does nothing. <laughs> She's sitting over there. Two times within the course of like a minute and a half or two minutes, the opposition has taken advantage of Jesse Jones as she is just sitting, you know, standing there like a mannequin or like a bump on a log. You know, she she's not doing anything to help her her alleged friend and or tag team partner. So now you have Jesse Jones having to fend for Jesse Jones. Because clearly her partner is not going to do anything to help her. Hadn't raised a finger, didn't even look like she was trying to come around the side to threaten them to stop nothing. She just just stood there. So, and you have her uh, cheering her on. That's about as, that is about as close as she got to doing anything useful. She clapped. <laughs> she, she stood there and clapped. That was about it. Beat on the mat a little bit. That's a, that, that was the extent of her helping her friend out while she was working three against one, essentially. Now, Jesse Jones is still doing a Jesse Jones match. She, she is working the arm, and she is so good at that. She has kept, you know, ice cold in place. Never mind the fact now for the third time, Exile gets up and tries to do something. She, she being Jesse Jones, has ice cold worked down to the mat, ready to apply the arm bar. Both Genesis and Exodus hop up on the apron, strike the referee. Again, these are things that heels are supposed to do. Jesse's had enough. She gets up and she charges both of them with double elbows and then gives both of them a drop kick through the ropes like she holds on the top rope and kicks them both down. She sees Ice Cold coming up on her. She gets a quick pop in the eye. Gets thumbs her in the eye. And then she works her down, and she applies that great arm bar and makes Ice Cold tap out. And she does a fantastic arm bar. I mean, it looks, it's probably as safe as it could be, but it just looks good on camera. I mean, it, on TV, that thing looks fantastic. And it... And I don't think, honestly, I don't think Ice Cold being as new or, you know, to this, I don't think it hurts her in the least because of how Jesse Jones had been presented. Is that, you know, hey, she's willing to do what she has to do to get that win. And that arm bar and wow has been protected. No one's gotten out of it. It is a protected move. So, she wins the match despite the odds and despite the fact, or I should say in spite of the fact that her friend 
did not lift a finger to help her. <laughs> I mean, and you could clearly see the cheating going on, but she did not do a single thing. So keep that in mind. At the end of this, Jesse cuts a promo, which of course is good, and her delivery makes this work. Her promo works better than most because she not only says, hey, I want a shot at the title. She, in a babyface form, basically says, hey, okay, look, there's people that are getting title shots. This person got a title shot. That person got a title shot. The only one that I can really regard as, as deserving one is the Beast. Of course, pop from the crowd. It makes sense. Beast did not lose the title. She had to give it up. But she, within the same breath, so to speak, she gets into her credentials. Telling, reminding everybody, I haven't been beaten. I have not been beaten. I've been pinned. I've been tapped out. Now, I don't know if they, I, I don't really like when Wild tries to apply the years to it because Wild had been on and off so that, that year thing with them or the time frame is a little wonky. So I I prefer, and this is just me, that they just stick to I, I've been undefeated through these events rather than chronologically I've been undefeated since 2014, you know, that type of thing. Because it, it's just, it's absurd. It's, it's, apply, it's implying that she has wrestled against a bunch of people since 2014 in WoW and was never beaten, which... You know, if you're removing the hiatuses that they've had, the various hiatus points, then maybe, but no. But in any case, her, her promo works because she gives her credentials and she justifies her spot. American just kind of stands around and smiles and, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. I have, <laughs> I, I promise you, I don't have anything against this woman, but... <laughs> But the more I see of her and I go back and I read that article that um, got Tessa fired more or less from 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 WoW. And look, we know Tessa has had a reputation of being difficult to work with and having some outbursts, including racist outbursts. So I'm not defending her. But in this particular instance, if this is the person and this is this is who reportedly they got on her about for yelling at her for not getting it and stuff like that Samantha Sage who is Americana if that is the person and this is the best that they got out of her I can probably see that there would be some frustration from Tessa Bunch like why are you not getting this <laughs> and I know everybody else around her probably you know they just catered to Americana Man, oh you're fine no she's not she's not fine she's done a terrible job She's doing a terrible job. Physically, she's she's great. And if she had enough time to do it, she probably would get far, far better. But she does not have it. She just doesn't. Putting her on national TV to be Americana does not help her at all. And I know she's not in a position where she will understand that. So anyway... Jesse Jones wins the match, cuts a promo at the end, love the promo. Like I said, it, it makes more sense than most because she was able to back up her promo with credentials. Then we go to the following segment. Ice Cold in Exile having a backstage segment, argument from nowhere. This is the first time that we have literally seen them argue on screen. And they're addressing behavior that we didn't see previously. So even though we're actually seeing this, they're talking about stuff that we haven't seen. And all this seems like it's doing is leading into the breaking up of exile, which I, I, I'm very disappointed in. But this is badly written, and it is badly acted. To have this woman in the show say I well let's start off with Ice Cold saying that you know you didn't help me with Jesse Jones or you lost to Jesse Jones too. He's like, well that's only because she cheated. Who would expect Jesse Jones not to follow the rules? I was like, really? <laughs> now granted, 
it is good that Ice Cold essentially called that out. She's like, are you even listening to yourself right now? And then she walks off. That probably was the best part of this whole thing. But yeah, I mean, it. this just seems like argument for argument's sake without any sort of build, without any sort of reason, without anything that would show the audience that they have beef with each other and here's the reason for the beef. None of those things took place. It just, like I said, it's just arguments for argument's sake. Because somebody in the back probably thought that this was going to be, this would be great. We'll break up eggs out. I don't know. This would be the story. Well, it's a bad story. It's a bad story, and it's badly done, and it's badly written, and it's badly executed. It's just bad. So then we go to the next segment, Americana and Jesse Jones. Now, I, here's the other thing I don't understand. What is up with these stares? Why does every conversation that takes place in Wild Now have to take place at the bottom of these damn stairs? What is... What are they trying to do with the steps? Are you telling me that nowhere else in this building you can't set up just an interview place, a wild backdrop, and a place for somebody to stand with a microphone, you're coming from the ring, and we ask you the question? Here is just where we have this invisible camera that's sitting at the bottom of the steps that everybody just magically wants to stop and talk in front of and express their feelings and how, you know, how the match went and so on and so forth. This stairway has been utilized over and over and over again. The first time it was okay. Second time, maybe. But then it was like three times in the one episode. And now it's just become the default location to have a conversation with people. Let's just go to the steps, the steps, the steps. She didn't have a locker room. Like Jesse Jones in this this segment here comes down the steps and then decides that she's going to start taking off her boots at the bottom of the steps. Why? You have a locker room. So this angle is also bad. (laughs) So you have Americana now carrying on about did you have to cheat, Jesse? <laughs> you know, Levi looks up there and, there and we go back to Levi. I asked this question several podcasts ago, and I will ask it again. If you remove her being a mom from the equation of this show, what is Americana? You don't hear her say anything promoting America. You don't hear her addressing America. She didn't come out with a flag. She doesn't even wear American colors. She doesn't talk about, well, they shouldn't even bring up politics. That should stay away from this show. But she doesn't talk about it as a great country and if we got, you know, anything to talk about why she is Americana whatsoever. The most that she talks about is Levi. And as she's going on about this, in my mind, it's like, why would anybody have sympathy for this? She she didn't even bother to help while her friend was being triple teamed. And you have the nerve to be like, you didn't have to cheat. She's like a lost puppy who does not understand that you want her to go away. It doesn't make any sense to her. And that's how she's being presented. She's like a, a, a 10-year-old who does not understand that, hey, well, maybe if you'd have got, got off your butt and came over there and helped me, I wouldn't have had to cheat. But that's an adult environment. And this is an environment for kids, so they, you know, they're, they're sticking with this paper-thin thor- story of you didn't have to do that. Why would you have to thumb it in the eye to win? You know, so I feel like they are trying to get sympathy for Americana, but they are failing at this miserably. It is just, it's beyond absurdity now. It is just beyond that. So 
So that is the thing. She has her last second plea to Amer- I mean, to Jesse Jones about you didn't have to do that. And then Jesse Jones gets up and you know more or less just tells her, "Look, I I um, do what I do best. I win, and you just you know stay in your lane." <laughs> that that's that basically what it comes down to. And you, uh, between the two of these, you would think that Jesse Jones is the actress here. She she gives far more fire and far more emotion, far more facial expression behind what's going on. Americana is just bland. She is so bland. I mean, it's, it's, it's like she doesn't even emote. She needs to take an acting class or she needs to go. I don't know how many different ways I can say it. She needs to go in the indies and she needs to learn how to do this and not just how to be a wild superhero because it ain't working. But the whole, I mean, if you want to see that angle, go to Cheating Isn't Necessary on, on Wild Superheroes page. You can see what I'm talking about. But you have to watch the match first. Watch the match first and then tell me who you agree with or who you line up with in this. So we go to the next thing. Last call, cutting the promo on the Tonga Twins, and they're going out the championships, which they've already announced. So this is this is a spot holder promo. And then we go to the main event. <clears throat> the Beast versus Vicky Lamb McCoy. The match that is so dangerous that we had it had to be completely unsanctioned because they're going to cause all kinds of problems across the arena, and we don't want anybody to get in the way of this 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 carnage that is about to unfold. So, Lauren Hunkel, I think that's how you pronounce her name. Pren- addresses the audience and announces on the arena floor rather than the ring. The explanation for this is being that for my safety, I've been informed that I should announce down here. I do not know why all of a sudden the ring would be more dangerous for rather than the floor. I mean, wouldn't they be able to just charge her at the, on the arena floor? It would be easier to get to her, matter of fact. So I don't understand what that was for. But again, as I said with the Lana Star, Vicky Lynn McCord segment, this is yet another way of them trying to sell the danger of this unsanctioned, no holds barred match because it's never happened in a while before except it did. So Vicky Lynn comes out. She's got a baseball bat with her. And she gets into the ring. Then the Beast comes out. And Vicky Lynn apparently is so poor a batter that she could not hit the Beast coming into the ring with a weapon and I have the high ground. She stood there and waited for the Beast to get up to her feet, took a high swing so the Beast could duck underneath it. And then get hit. I mean, now I'm not a wrestler, and I don't, you know, I don't know different. But I would think if I had the high ground and I had a bat in my hand, the second you stick your head through those ropes, that bat is coming down across the back of your skull. I would think that, but you know, hey, that's applying a little bit too much logic there. So anyway, the Beast, Vicky Lynn, they get at it in the ring. And bear in mind, this is not some sort of technical masterpiece. Nor is it a a great brawl in wrestling, but it is a great brawl for a while. If that makes sense to you also. Within their environment, this is a great brawl. It wouldn't necessarily be that outside of WoW, in my opinion. I think outside of WoW, it would be just a standard thing. It it, It would be... Average at best. The Beast does a, a nice German suplex on Vicky Lynn McCoy, and you know she gets up and she does her pose and all that good stuff. Vicky Lynn tries to get a German suplex on the Beast. The Beast is able to stop it. Once they got to the floor, they pretty much stayed on the floor, and. 
And I guess that would be the thing that constitutes it being unsanctioned and so on and so forth. Nikki Lynn goes back after a bat and she does the, the typical uh, wrestling bat usage. She jams it into the beast's stomach and then immediately throws it down. She gets a steel chair from underneath the ring and gingerly hits the beast on the back. Not not a great hit. I was expecting a little bit more out of Vicky Lynn on that, but she she didn't crank it down on the back. She didn't wallop her with it. She tried a second time. The beast blocked it and then kicked Vicky Lynn in the stomach, and then she tries to go for a, a smack across Vicky Lynn's back. Vicky kicks her in the stomach and prevents her from doing it. I am curious as to whether this match actually went longer than what it is because within like two minutes, they both looked like they were like completely exhausted. <clears throat> and I should have rephrased that, that the bulk of the match was on the floor, not all of the match. So back to the notes. They go back in. Vicky Lynn has the chair in her, her, her hands and she starts attacking the knee of the beast. And I know part of that, they're trying to sell it like, oh, well, she's going after that reconstructed, that leg that just healed and you know, all that good stuff. But it wasn't really going after the ankle. It was going after, like I said, the knee, which wasn't the injury that was reported. So I don't know where that's, that's really coming from. They keep cutting the shots of kids. Which, so if you've ever had any, any sort of, uh, question as to who this is made for there you go it was made for the children so Vicky Lynn is attacking the knee of uh, the beast doesn't really go much further than the initial attacks on the beast but you know this is not like she tried to apply a figure for a leg lock or you know, something like that to go for a submission it was just I'm going after the knee just to go after the knee, and, and we're not doing anything else with that. She gets up on the second rope, attempting to uh, what they called pilmanize the, the, the uh, ankle. She puts the chair, or she puts the ankle in between the folding portion of the chair. And then she goes up in a somewhat awkward fashion as she walks you know, backwards up the thing to sit on the second rope, and she's moving like super slow. I know she's doing this to give Beast time to get up and get the chair out of the way and smack her in the head, which is what she did. Takes a good bump, goes off the, the ropes, rolls off to the floor. Referee comes down, oh, my, you're okay. You know, so, and the Beast is having to try to struggle to get back up to her feet. Again, this is a, a spot of sympathy. The, the Beast have something to overcome her own injury. Will she be able to fight back through the pain? Is she this cyborg that everybody makes her out to be in, in, in wild lore? And so she goes out to the floor with her hurting ankle, and she insists on, I mean, not verbally, but you get what I'm saying. She insists on continuing to fight. So Vicky Lynn McCoy is standing up near the, the barricade, the beast on her bad leg, decides that I'm going to charge across here and give you a spear into the barricade, which is what she does or what she attempts to do. Except Vicky Lynn gets out of the way and then the beach just spears right into the, the barricade itself. Vicky then tries to uh, take advantage of that situation where she does a kind of a low cross body on, on the beast she because the bees after she hits her her head against the, the barricade sits kind of sits there. Vicky Lynn goes across, runs, and then hits her with her crossbody while she's in the seated position. Goes for the cover, the beast kicks out. This match, although fine, although fine, is in hyper slow motion. Now, and, and the reason I say it's fine, even though they're moving like they are, is that for, for this crowd, it probably required them to be in slow motion so they can understand what's going on, so they can understand what is being done, you know, physically within the match. And I know a good portion of this is trying to sell the, uh, the, the brutality, if you will, of the, of the match. It's hard for me to look at this and say there was absolute brutality in it 
it's not much different than any other match, save for the fact that they didn't get counted out and they were able to use the chair a couple of times. Like outside of that, what it 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 didn't feel any different than the Falls kind of anywhere that uh uh the Tonga Twins and Miami Sweet Heat had. It didn't feel any different than the the follow up no no DQ match that they had. None of those things felt I mean any different than this. This being so unsanctioned and so wild. Like the schoolyard brawl was was wilder than this in terms of them just running around, and that was ridiculous too. So in any in any case, the beast got a hold of the uh, I shouldn't say of the baseball bat, but she got a hold of a baseball bat, and she does the same thing that Vicky Lynn did to her in the beginning. I'm gonna put this in the way that wrestlers hold it. I'm gonna put my hand at the top of the bat. And then I'm going to punt this into your gut. Now, I, that is not a wild thing. That is just something that has happened with wrestling over the years that we hit people with these blunt objects in a very unnatural way. I don't know anybody that would do that, but I cannot put that off on wild because you can go back as far as Triple H and Sting with baseball bats and sledgehammers, and they all do it. So the beast. Pops her in the stomach. Vicky Lynn goes down. Then she gets in the suplex. She being the beast. Beast gets Vicky Lynn in the suplex. And that sets her up for a second attempt at a spear. And the beast is ready and she charges and she hits her with a good spear on the outside. If the beast is going to continue using the spear, they should probably take it away from other people so that hers is, is the spear of record for the uh, for the show. But even though she gets up, you know, she, Vicky Lynn gets pretty much right on up with her. So I don't know what the spear is in that regard. She, you know, they, they both kind of got up together. Did it, did it hurt Vicky Lynn or not? Beast starts sizing her up again for what appears to be a second one. Vic, Vicky Lynn's by the post. We all know where this is going. Beast charges. Vicky Lynn gets out of the way, and, and the Beast posts herself against the, the, the ring post outside like i said the bulk of this match takes place on the outside of the ring that then gives the opening to vicky lynn mccoy she gets a german and she tosses the beast across the floor uh, almost to the other side of the ring almost to the the other uh not turnbuckle but ring post most of these people that are there in that building either had to hate this match (laughs) <laughs> or they had a big screen TV that allowed them to watch it because a lot of this took place well out of the view of the people that's in that audience. It, it's, it's like if they have anything that's decisively uh, on the floor with weapons or whatever, tables, chairs, what have you, we got to make sure we do it on the hard cam side on the floor. We can't go around. I mean, I would have, I would have, liked them to at least go on to the other side or you know just in front of some of the fans the, if, they, if they were going to make this out to be some sort of crazy brawl that no one could contain and it's so violent that that wow refuses to sanction the match because we don't want to be responsible for it they didn't really explain what unsanctioned is by the way i mean that that's generally what an unsanctioned match is it is so far gone with these two that we do not want to take responsibility. We as a company do not want to take responsibility for the pain and or potential injury that they may give each other. If you want to have the match, you can have it in our ring but, and we'll record it, but we do not sanction this match. So that, that's the explanation, but that, that explanation never took place on air. I'm just providing a little little side note. So, here we are at the end. Vicky has done her German, and now she gets a table from underneath the ring. And, you know, the crowd is having a great time because they keep cutting to it. So, she sets up the table, (laughs) and she is attempting to put the beast on that table for what we don't know because she never got that far. 
Why didn't she get that far? Because I'm going to explain it. So Vicky Lynn has to be, she put her head to the uh, the apron to try to soften her up, and then she starts setting her up on the table. Like, I'm going to put you here, and I'm going to come through it some kind of way. And it didn't even look like a position that any person would have ever set up for or taken. Like, she put the beast on her stomach. So right then and there, I was like, okay, we are, I know that she's not going to land on her, not like that. She'll break that woman's back. With her laying on her stomach, and the only place for her to come down on is her spine. No, that's that's not happening. And much like she did inside of the ring, she goes up in what I would consider a pretty vulnerable way and an unnatural way. She goes up with her back turned, and she's moving extremely slow. Slow enough to where, of course, the beast gets off, and I am also going to assume that there was something in between here because there was a big jump cut. It was like Vicky Lynn at one point was on her knees and then all of a sudden she was standing up on both feet and the beast just ran underneath her and got into powerbomb position. I, I keep coming back to, I don't know what Vicky Lynn was attempting to do, that she passively put the beast on the table and then gingerly gets up on the apron where the beast is no longer in her sight with her back turned to her directly over top of the table while I'm doing this. Which gave the beast a perfect opening. She gets underneath her, like I said, following the jump cut. And then she power bombs her through the table or more or less the Vicky Lynn threw herself through the table. There's a one, two, three and the beast wins. And whatever injuries that she had on her leg and ankle and whatnot disappeared immediately after she won that match. So she stands in the center of the ring huffing and puffing and, you know, I'm the beast, I'm the greatest, and the biggest, the baddest, et cetera, et cetera. So the beast, within two months of her coming back, has already gone through what potentially would have been her biggest opponent's in the in the company. She squashed Chainsaw and she just defeated Vicky Lynn McCoy pretty soundly. There's no reason for them to come back to these now. They didn't even, they couldn't even build to it good. So we have that. Vicky Lynn loses. The Beast carries on. And she is in route of a championship match, as we all know that is going to happen. These matches are perfectly fine with me. And and even the main event, as slow as it was, as I said, it probably would not be a good main event match outside of WoW, nor would it be a good uh, no holds barred match outside of WoW. But in, in a WoW environment, it's passable. It probably, they need to lay off of that stipulation for a good while. They do not need to revisit this. Because I don't care how many different ways they label it, and, and it's pretty much that. They had this same match three times, labeled three different things. That's pretty much all they've done. And they do not need to readdress or redress the same stipulation over and over and over again. Let this go. Let's go through the pros and the cons of the show. The cons we'll start off with. While it's inconsistent on rules and what is dangerous, for the reasons that I just said, they do not stick to, we just had this match. Why is this match any different? And they're inconsistent with delivering storylines. Why is this any more dangerous than the previous one? How are you trying to even convince people that it's more dangerous than the previous one? Two, over-explained open open contract. David McLean's word salad. That is just too much. Too much. 
Three, Americana's angle gets no sympathy for her and is poorly executed. For all reasons that I mentioned earlier. Four, Exile's angle with Ice Cold also poorly executed and still has gaps in what we've seen. We don't know why they're angry with each other. We don't know where this started. It just, it just is. Five, the commentary at some times are hard to listen to. I, I don't like saying that, but at points when they start carrying off on trying to get these backstories and this stuff took place in a while and, and then they start giving it the, the commentary that's angle for the kids. If she had just realized that the, the power of positivity was in her all along, you know, just nonsense like that. It's hard to listen to them at times. Six, there was no build for this main event, or at least it wasn't built well. There was no heat here. It was just a match. And I've said that WoW has interchangeable parts before. This is just a match for the Beast with an interchangeable part. This would have been Reina Del Rey. This would have been Chainsaw. This would have been Vicky Lane McCoy. This would have been anybody that was of, of substantial size that they could have slotted into this just to have this match. It didn't, it wasn't anything that was built well, nor did it have any kind of drive or desire to like, I want to see the Beast get her revenge. I mean, they couldn't even take the time to have Vicky Lynn talk the match up when they had that sit down interview. They let her sit down, they set it up with a long video package. She explained for 30 seconds that, well, I just want to be the, 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 I'm the dominant woman in a while. That's it. I'm done talking. Like 30 seconds later, she was out of there. That was the time to sell the match. And they didn't do it. They chose to do that instead. But were the cons enough to devalue the entirety of the show? Maybe. It wasn't enough in my view for the show itself. Watching this on YouTube or watching the segments on YouTube will not properly illustrate how well the editors, and I will put this in the lap of the editors, how well they paced that show. The pros, the promos on this show, except for the beast, come off as less scripted than usual and made sense. Two, the matches are mostly good. I don't have a complaint between bell to bell that, I mean, they're short matches, but if we're just looking at the match and the quality and what they did, you know, between one competitor to the next, they did a good job. Three, emphasis is being placed on the championship. And I will say more emphasis on the championship, unlike anything I've seen them do in the past. I don't know where they're going to go with it, and I and I will go on record. I hope I will be wrong. I think they're going to oversell some multi-person match. He's going to hype it up like it's the greatest thing ever in wrestling, and it'll under-deliver. I hope I'm wrong. Where was I? That was three. Number four, the pacing of the show is good. I just said that, but I'll repeat it. That's the note there. The pacing of the show is good. Editors did a fine job. Five... It feels like the show is, I don't know if it's on purpose, but this particular one felt like it was trying to get away from that old wow slash glow 80s feel. It still has a lot of plot holes and inconsistency, but it felt more in line of what you would have seen on a Monday Night Raw. And I only mean that in terms of pacing. Like it. It didn't give a lot of time to breathe between things. They're like they went to this, oh, something's happened in the back. Let's go. You know, it, it was that. And whereas they don't need to do that every week because you can burn that out, it did made make the show or this particular episode feel differently. It just felt a little better. Getting from one thing to the next. And I was absolutely good with that. So there was the entirety of the episode. Overall, I thought it was a very passable episode. Even though 
there were a lot of things that took place in between it, in between the matches that I do not agree with, that I absolutely think make no sense. Once you get past that, it is the show in and of itself, matches match by match was a good show. I would give it, you know, a C plus or maybe, you know, maybe a good B minus. But it, but it was still worth watching. If you if you just came into the WoW and this was like a first episode for you, I could see where it, it might get you to come back and look at it again. So that was that, folks. That was the episode. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope the chapter markers help. I've been I've been trying to I've been experimenting with that, and I hope that applying those uh, help get through the show or at least find the segment that you're looking for the, the review that you're trying to hear rather than having to go through the entirety of it and, and scan uh, maybe this helps a bit uh, <clears throat> I do want to thank those who tune in and do provide a thumbs up when you do and for the ones that have even gone on to the shop tab and even looked <laughs> at some of the stuff so uh, thank you for that and speaking of the shop tab Hey, there are shirts and pants, both leggings and jogging pants available that you can go and get. I need to make some more stuff to, to put on that uh, that shop page. But as of right now, you can get the what I had the rustling parody shirt, which she has a uh, our show name. Well, not the show channel name and the font and in the setup of a certain major wrestling event. And I only put wrestling parody logo because you know I didn't want to take any lawsuit. Uh, the, the leggings are there with the, with the same, uh, we'll call it manic design. The no silly stuff wrestling shirt is also available. Stuff is is not the word that is used, although we don't spell it out there either. And the, the, the uh, previous logo shirts, which I didn't use very long, but uh, some people seem to like the uh, aggressive font that was used in that wrestling, the Women's Pro Wrestling Network shirt. All of those things and a little bit more are available now on the uh, spring site. I was about to say spring tea, but they don't go by that anymore. It's just spring. But you don't have to go through that to get it. All you got to do is go down to the bottom of this page. It should have a shop on the Women's Pro Wrestling Network store. Link there with the, with a couple of designs and things uh, right there in front of you. Of course, you can go to the channel. You can hit the shop tab. That will take you there as well. And if you have any doubt about anything, whether you find the videos, whether you find the old matches that we had, whether you find other podcasts that were done here, you can always go to WPNWrestling.com, WPNWrestling.com, and that is the center point, the nexus of everything that the WPN does, says, produces, and provides, and also has a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week stream, so if you're unfamiliar with some of the matches, some of the persons, some of the gameplay because every once in a while I'll do some gameplay because I get bored and I miss doing commentary so I would you know I would do do that from time to time but all of those things run on that uh, website all day every day so there you have it folks again thank you for tuning in thank you for your time thank you for listening to the show if you downloaded it thank you for that on your greater podcast platforms if you're on youtube thank you for it here uh please subscribe and like it keeps this thing up and it keeps us within the purview for when people look up women's wrestling we get tossed into that mix so long as you have uh helped us out the way that you've been helping out and i hope that you continue to that said we are wrapping this up so for myself this is Mr. Green saying that this is Mr. Green saying so long and we will see you on the next go round. Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening to the WPN's Rights and Wrongs of Pro Wrestling. If you have questions or comments, please contact us via our Facebook or our YouTube channel 
at the Women's Pro Wrestling Network. If you're new to the WPN, feel free to subscribe to our channel and like our page. We appreciate your support. Thank you again for listening.